Well, can you use brake cleaner to clean your rifles? And can you use a brush in the bore instead of just a jag? Someone suggests not. And how do you prevent barrel burnout? All that and more on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. Hello, folks, and welcome back. We've got a lot of questions and a few answers today, so let's get right to it. This is from a patron. His name is Anthony, and he says, Good evening, Ron. I want to thank you for your channel. I was a little over two years ago that I lost my grandfather. He was the one who introduced me at a young age to the outdoors, including hunting, fishing, camping, and everything in between. From starting out with a 300 Savage, to a six millimeter Remington. I was able to share so many years with him before he left this earth. I came across your channel and it was like I was listening to him all over again. Your knowledge, your love of firearms and the outdoors is everything he was about and now I am too. I'm able to turn your channel on and drive down the road and feel like my grandpa is sitting right there next to me talking about guns and the great outdoors. Wow. Anthony, that that almost brings tear to my eye. That is pretty sweet. Um, that is an honor, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, let's see if we can get to some something that might be of a bit more interest to you gun nuts out there. Uh, shot shell ballistics. Let's not go there just yet. I want to talk. Well, let's do that. I don't often cover shot shells because just not that many people seem to be interested. But I have noticed that when I do, I get a lot of questions from folks because I don't think we dwell on it as much as we do with our rifle cartridges. But when the subject comes up, a lot of us realize I don't quite understand what's going on here with these shot shells. So excuse me if you are a shotgunning expert and you already know all this stuff, but there are always new hunters coming on board who need to figure it out. And shotguns can be a little bit mystifying. So let's see what Seth has to ask us here. I was just listening to your podcast about shot shell ballistics. That was season two, episode 66. My father-in-law invited me and two uh, brother-in-laws on a bird hunt on uh, last November. None of us had ever hunted birds before. We paid for a guide and two dogs. We shot several pheasants, chuckers, and quail. Before the hunt, the email from the guide said that we should bring six to eight uh, shot. That's the size of your pellet. And uh, had no information on chokes. We were all using our 12 gauges, so we discussed which chokes to use, and we uh, were all in disagreement with each other. So I selected seven and a half shot size and an improved cylinder choke. This is going to be a wise choice. The other three chose six shot and modified or full chokes. I had the time of my life taking five to one as many birds as they did. To the point that they were asking to buy my seven and a half shot shells. <laughs> which I gave them. Luckily, I had brought a backpack and 200 rounds of shells because I half expected this to happen. So all that I ask is, what is your favorite choke and shot size for pheasant and quail? Thank you. <laughs> Those are some good questions, Seth. And I'm going to elaborate a bit. With shotgunning for upland birds, you get options in shot size usually matched to the size of the bird. So if you're shooting a small bird like a quail, smaller shot, and those sizes would be eight or seven and a half up towards six. You really don't want to go any larger than that on a smaller bird because as you go up in pellet size in any given shell with any given quantity or weight of uh, pellets in it, you are going to have fewer pellets as the size gets bigger. So if you've got a one ounce charge or a one and a quarter ounce charge of shot and it's six shot, there will be fewer pellets in there than if it were eight shot because eight is smaller. That means you've got more pellets to hit that tiny bird. He's not going to be able to fly through a hole in your pattern of pellets. But if it's a larger bird like a pheasant, well, you can go to a larger shot size like six or even five or four and the bird is big enough that even though your pattern is opening up down range, it's not going to make a hole big enough for that pheasant to get through. So ideally, you want to get three or more pellets on your bird for a pretty good solid kill. And that's what you're trying to strive for. Now, the choke comes into play on this one because a choke is a constriction in your muzzle near the muzzle of your shotgun. 
that tightens up your pattern downrange. As this shot shell spits all the pellets out, those pellets are not spinning like a rifle bullet, so you don't get a precision shot downrange. They just flow out of the tube and they begin to veer in the wind to one degree or another because they're not perfectly smooth and round. And then they open up in a cone shape downrange. And traditionally, we use a 30-inch circle when your shotgun choke and shot shell pattern, pretty much 70% of all those pellets inside of a 30-inch circle at a certain distance, that determines what you want to use for different birds based on how large they are or how far away they are when you shoot. Obviously, none of us can predict how far away the bird's going to be when we shoot, other than to agree that we're not going to shoot at something that's 50 yards or 60 yards away. Uh, on rare occasions, we do that. But in general, with upland birds, they may be flushing right at your feet. They may flush at 30 or 40 yards. You have to be ready for those occasions with your choke selection, as well as your shell and pellet size collection. So with a choke, the uh, tighter the choke, the further downrange you can reach with a tight pattern. But for the close shots, it's too tight of a pattern. And you either miss the bird because your pattern is small or you tear it up with too many pellets. So with close flushing birds like quail, we generally go with an open choke. And that could be a true cylinder, which is no choke at all, or an, an improved cylinder, which Seth used here, which chokes it down a little bit. I find the improved cylinder to work really well for quail, but even most all the upland birds. Unless I'm I'm hunting late in the season on really wild flushing sharp-tailed grouse or pheasants, then I want to go to a tighter choke. If you anticipate shooting long ranges where your birds are more like 35 to 50 yards out rather than 10 yards to 25 yards out, you will want to go to a full choke. If they're somewhere between about 30 yards to 40 yards, it's usually a modified choke. So you need to balance all of this stuff with your shotgun. And it doesn't matter that much if it's a 12 gauge or a 20 gauge or any of the other ones, because you can get them all to pattern pretty nicely. What happens with these smaller gauges is, of course, you have lesser quantity of shot. You can't put a, an ounce and a quarter of pellets in a 28 gauge, for instance. So you're going to have fewer pellets going down range, which means you are not going to have a dense pattern as far out. And a good average is about five yards less effective reach with your smaller gauges as you step down from a 10 gauge to a 12 gauge to a 16 to a 20 to a 28. And then your 410, which is not even a gauge, that is a caliber, <laughs> but it's about a 60, a 62 or 64 if it were in a gauge. So I I hope that straightens it out for you guys if you're bird hunting. Um, as a general rule, improved cylinder or modified choke in your shotgun is your best for general upland bird hunting. And shot sizes seven and a half to five are probably going to cover the waterfront for you. Then in special occasions, you can vary from that. I hope that helped you out, Seth. And I think your friends and your brothers-in-law and stuff here have figured it out. <laughs> Thanks to you. All right. Now, this is Russell. And Russell asks about cleaning. Here we're going to get into the bore cleaning for your rifle barrels. Ron, I hope you're well. I have a gun cleaning question. After watching your video from a few years ago, is it okay to use a bore brush instead of a jag? If so, is the bore brush supposed to be the same size as the bore or slightly undersized? Last question, is it okay to use brake cleaner or mass airflow sensor spray for parts like the bolt face and other parts that need a quick degreasing? Thanks. I wrote back to Russell Patron. Uh, yes, you can use brake cleaner in the bore. It is basically what most, if not all, gun solvents are made of. All the copper or the uh, carbon solvents are basically brake cleaner. So you can use that just fine. Now, I'm not sure what a mass airflow sensor spray is, but I can't see where airflow would hurt anything unless it drives a sand grain into a mechanical part. For instance, inside of the bolt body, it would jam up the firing pin. But you could strip that down and clean it anyway. But as for brushes, bronze brushes, over or undersized, are fine for cleaning rifle barrels. Brass is much softer than barrel steel. I use... Uh, nylon stiff nylon as well as brass but i yeah, generally will use the brass when i really need a hard cleaning 
And I like to use JB Bohr compound. Now, this is a, a gritty compound, but a very, very fine grit. They say it's as fine as jeweler's polish, and it's perfectly safe to use in your firearms. A lot of target shooters will use this. It comes in a paste form, and you put that on, well, either a cotton patch on a jag that's fairly tight or on a, br a brush, and you put that compound on there, that JB, and then you begin to scour the bore. And boy, that cleans out fouling really quickly. Then you have to clean the compound out after that and follow it up with a good flush of bore solvent. But that speeds things up quite nicely, and I really recommend that. Um, and then I told uh, Russell that I no longer clean all the copper from my bores. Several years ago, that was a big deal. You had to get copper cleaner and get all that copper out because you had copper fouling. But we've since found out that until it becomes too much, Initially, you lay down some copper for your all-copper bullets, and you continue to shoot copper bullets on that, and you get better accuracy than if you clean it every time because of the consistency as much as anything. And by that, I mean if you have a perfectly clean barrel, well, wonderful for your first shot, but then you'd have to clean it again for your second shot to be consistent because that first shot is going to lay down some carbon fouling and some copper fouling. But if you shoot one, two, or three fouling shots, then things seem to settle in. And you can continue firing quite a few shots and maintain your accuracy. But if it gets too heavily fouled down the road after 10 shots or 20 shots, and some rifles will even go as far as 50 to 100 rounds before they begin to lose accuracy. So why not keep shooting them? Because you've got the consistency. You know that your barrel is fouled. You know that it's working well with your particular load and bullet. If you continue to shoot that load and bullet, why clean the barrel and then have to start all over again? That's kind of the new thinking. Now, some guys will say, well, I'm going to clean after every 20 shots regardless. That's up to you. It's <laughs> free country. Clean the way you need to. But I've just found over the years that if I've got a barrel shooting very well, it really doesn't matter if it's had 10 rounds or 50 through it. When the accuracy starts to go south, that's when I clean it. Now, some folks take exception to using a uh, bore brush. And here is one <laughs> called Jim. I found his comment on one of my earlier presentations on cleaning. And he said, Ron, only a moron runs a brush down the tube. Guess that's me. <laughs> patch with solvent only, exclamation point. Keep changing the patches until it come out, meaning until they come out with zero discoloration. Then oil it and pull it away. Put it away. And Jim is repeating what many have said for many years. Uh, and the emphasis I think Jim is trying to make here is that you really want to be gentle with your bore so you don't damage it, you don't scratch it. And a lot of people think bore brushes would do that. And yet the industry sells bore brushes left and right. And various uh, target shooters, long-range shooters, you name it, clean with brushes. I have for years. I have taken classes from a lot of precision training instructors and they clean with patches and they clean with brushes. It really doesn't seem to matter. It's all over the map. People have their opinions, but I have never seen good hard data that says if you use a bronze brush in your bore when you clean, you're going to wear that bore out or destroy it. I just never seen any evidence for that. But if you are extra concerned, you can certainly take the route that Jim is suggesting here. Only use soft cotton patches with the solvent and let the chemical action do all your cleaning, not the physical abrasion doing your cleaning for you. You know, it makes a certain degree of sense, but man, have I found it takes a long time to do that cotton patch <laughs> without any abrasive on it at all. Um, so I like a bronze brush or a nylon brush. I think the nylon brush, a lot of guys like it because it seems a little safer than bronze, but you got to think about steel and how hard it is and then copper or bronze and nylon and how soft they are. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to be all right. I certainly haven't noticed any degradation in the uh, barrel quality from the rifles I'm cleaning with brushes. But it's always nice to consider different ideas and different experience from different people. Now, here's another one. This is from Thorsheim. Ron, when you clean the bore of a rifle, you must cover the lenses of the scope. What? Oh, I know what he's getting at. 
The delicate lens coating can literally be destroyed by the spatter of drops of, say, Hoppy's 9, Bortec, and all the other solvents. Bore solvents and scopes do not go together, and he is absolutely right. I discovered this the hard way years ago, but he caught me doing it on a video where I forgot to put the cover on the scope, and that happens to me way too often. I get busy, and I just start cleaning it, and I realize, ooh, I forgot to put a cover, especially over the objective lens, and when I come out the end of the barrel, especially with a brush, there's a fine spatter of solvent and it can drift back onto that lens. And then you've got solvent on the surface of an expensive scope lens. Definitely avoid that by covering it up. I usually keep an oversized scope cover right there on my cleaning bench so that I can see it and remember to put it over the lenses of the scope so you don't have that problem. Great point. Thorsheim, I really appreciate that one. Great point, Thorsheim. I really appreciate that tip. Okay, now we've got somebody complaining about the 30 out 6 being compared to a 300 Magnum. Uh, he says, duh, the 30 out 6 can't replicate the 300 Magnums. However, the 308 is probably inherently more accurate than all of the 30 calibers. That's why most competitive shooters choose the 308. There's a reason why there are so many cartridges available, because each one has its own characteristics that others may not have. All cartridges are very capable in the hands of experienced shooters. It all comes down to the job at hand. Yeah, that's, that's pretty solid advice there, Bob. I, of course, as I've said many times, will disagree with you about the 308 Winchester being the most inherently accurate cartridge in the world, and we might get into that a little bit later. I just had a session with somebody uh, typing, mailing back and forth on that one. But you're right there. Most cartridges can do the job. You know, we love to debate and argue about, is this one better than that one? Is the 270 better than the 280, than the 30 at six and all the rest? And we go on and on. And a lot of pragmatic listeners get frustrated and say, for gosh sakes, they all kill deer. Just take one, learn how to use it properly, become a good shot, and learn how to stalk your game and get close. They will all work, and they certainly will. But like anyone really diving deep into his sport, we like to try to find the absolute best, whatever that might be, whatever we think it might be. So I don't think I'm ever going to stop investigating all these different cartridges and analyzing them and doing all sorts of research, even though I know I could take, say, a 3030 or a 3378 Weatherby Magnum or anything else you give me and go hunting with it for the rest of my career and do just fine. It's just a lot of fun to play around with all this stuff. All right, now let's see. Oh, here's another response to a video I did on, I think, the 30 6 and this, the point of it was, is this the most versatile cartridge in the world? That old argument, you hear it all the time. And uh, this gentleman says, because it is the most versatile caliber ever, what other caliber can shoot a 100 grain difference in bullet weights other than maybe a heavy, dangerous game cartridge? Well, that's a good point. Uh, it's often been made that the 30 out 6 can accurately shoot bullets weighing from 100 grains all the way up to 230 grains, sometimes even 250 grains, depending on the twist rate. But in general, we always figure 100 to 220, and that is an extensive line of bullet weights. The 7 millimeters, you might find some 100 grain bullets going up toward 181. I think there's a 195 out now. So you're getting close with the seven millimeters. And the, I think the real question is, do you need to have more bullet selection or can they uh, do the trick? And I think they can. Uh, so the sevens are awfully close to the thirties. Um, and of course, if you want to argue versatile 30 caliber cartridges, you could jump right over the 30 out six and go to the 300 Win Mag or now the 300 PRC or any of the larger 30s because obviously you get more velocity in that bullet. It should be more effective, have longer range, deflect less in the wind using the same bullets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then you have the recoil issue and the expense issue and the burning out the barrel issue. <laughs> They're always an argument to any side of this you take. Now, since I brought up barrel burning, we are going to go to Steve, who's got a question about that. 
Now, it's a simple question with a pretty long answer, but I think it's going to be an efficient answer that we might learn from. He asks, is it true that a 243 barrel will get shot out after only 1,000 or 1,200 rounds or thereabouts? And I'm pretty sure he means the 243 Winchester. So I responded to him this way. No, Steve. All barrel burnout is a product of heat and some chemical reaction between the burning powder and the barrel steel. It's mainly heat. The larger the powder volume and the narrower the bore, the hotter the flame at the lead or the throat, that's the start of the rifling. And as that steel heats and cools, it expands and contracts and expands and contracts. And this creates a maze of pits and tiny cracks that look like alligator hide or a crumbling old sidewalk. If you choke a 308 Winchester case down to a 243, and that's what the 243 Winchester is, and you are burning the same quantity of powder, it's in a much narrower bore. So the 243 Winchester barrel will burn out sooner than the 308 Winchester barrel. How much sooner? Well, that depends on the flame temperature of the powder used. Some powders burn cooler than others. And the rapidity of your shots. And this is the critical one. Shoot repeatedly and so quickly that you can't touch your barrel without burning your fingers and you are seriously reducing barrel life. Stainless steel barrels are reported to resist heat cracking better than standard chrome molly barrels. Finally, there is no clear-cut definition of shot-out barrel. A minute of angle barrel doesn't suddenly start throwing precision uh, bullets into a group the diameter of a basketball hoop at 100 yards. Accuracy decline is rather gradual. So an average hunter would be thrilled to have a one half MOA or even a one MOA barrel. Whereas a target shooter, a precision target shooter, he might throw that barrel away if it went from shooting, say, one eighth MOA to one quarter MOA. Give me that barrel. I'll be happy to take it hunting. So one man's trash is another man's treasure. This is why some say that the 308 Winchester barrel will last for 5,000 rounds, while others claim it goes for 10,000 rounds. The 243 Winchester is considered target accurate through 1,500 to 2,500 shots, but it's hunting accurate to perhaps 3,000 to as many as 5,000 shots. The main things to remember about barrel life are these. Number one, barrels are like truck tires. They wear out and they can be replaced. If you want to drive your truck 70 miles an hour, start and stop quickly, screech around corners and roar down rough, rocky roads, your tires are going to wear out more quickly than if you drive 20 miles an hour on new asphalt only. Is your objective to baby your tires or get where you need to go quickly? Number two, flame temperature is a barrel's deadliest enemy. So don't rapid fire in large volume. Number three, the smaller the bore and the larger the powder capacity, the shorter the barrel life. Number four, a shot out target barrel could remain a deadly accurate hunting barrel for hundreds, perhaps even thousands more shots. Number five, you are unlikely to shoot out a barrel by big game hunting alone. Number six, don't shortchange yourself by buying a centerfire hot rod and then babying it like a Fabergé egg. Shoot it, enjoy it, use that barrel for its intended job. They make more barrels every day. Now, if anyone is watching this rather than just listening to it, I've got some cartridges here that really showcase what I'm talking about. These are all uh, 26 calibers, 6.5 millimeter cartridges. We have an old classic here, the 6.5x55 Swede, which has a relatively small capacity for powder. The powder volume there is small. You move up to this middle one and you're looking at a 264 Winchester Magnum. And that is probably the most famous, that or the 220 Swift, for burning out barrels. Well, and you can see why. A lot more powder capacity in that. It's a longer case and it's a fatter case. So you're going to be shoving more hot powder flame down a narrow bore. They're both the same diameter on the bore. Now you step up to the modern 6.5 by 300 Weatherby Magnum. And that's another jump up from the 264 Win Mag. So which one do you think is going to burn out your barrel the fastest?
Don't make the mistake of thinking it's the bullet friction going down the barrel that wears it out. The barrel's throat burns out and you lose accuracy long before there's any friction on the rifling down the bore farther that wears anything out. So that's not the issue. I hope that clears it up for a lot of you guys. Just don't shoot hot barrels. That's the number one job. All right, here is someone called Big Dad. Ron, I'm a new listener, and I've been listening for a couple of weeks now. I finally broke down and got on Patreon. Well, thank you for joining us there, Big Dad. Um, hmm, he wants me to put something in a podcast or on YouTube. He likes to state this. Anything over 30 caliber should be outlawed and only used on very large game and dangerous game because a well-placed shot from a 224 to a 257 caliber is all that is needed. The whole thing, bigger and better, is an American macho thing. Love what you do. Thanks for all the informative and interesting stuff you talk about. You know, that's really interesting, Big Dad, because I, I just got chewed out by one guy for, for shooting too small of cartridges, and I think we might want to dive into that next because he's really letting me have it. This is from someone called Rancho, and he says, Total bull, and you can fill in the last four letters of that word, total bull. I find deer on the National Forest this time of year shot with a substandard caliber or by a long-range hunter and both favorite subjects of yours, so I'm unsubscribing to your nonsense. <laughs> this was in response to a podcast I did on varmint rounds for deer hunting. Someone asked about a 243, I think, and this is what this guy is incensed about. And in that video, I talked about uh, bullets, varmint bullets from a small calibers exploding inside of the heart, lungs, and being really effective. And a lot of folks wrote back to say that's exactly what they've seen over the years. They will use fairly light and high velocity bullets that break up inside of the animal's chest cavity. And of course, that creates kind of like a little bomb crater. The bullet breaks into tiny pieces over the heart and lungs, and man, you get massive hemorrhaging very quickly. And it kills quickly. This guy doesn't believe it, so he calls it bull. But I don't know how you can argue with so many people saying that it works, including moi, <laughs> because I've done it. And I've gotten more dramatic kills with some of these 24 caliber cartridges like the 243 and the 6mm Remington using these light frangible bullets. Now, of course, I always warn that there's the potential for that bullet not to get inside. So you don't want to be taking a snapshot and hitting the shoulder. There's the potential the bullet won't get inside. But even then, on the few occasions that it's happened to me, that bullet has gotten inside and done the job. So I don't think it's as touchy as some folks like this gentleman might think it is. That said, he is certainly entitled to his opinion. Um, more power to you if you want to stick with the 30 calibers and larger, for instance, that a previous gentleman said should be outlawed because they're too big. <laughs> you can make that choice. That just tells us how many different options are out there and how many different opinions are out there to match. But once again, I'm going to read some quick responses from some other commenters about their light calibers for deer. And this is Richard. He said, my grandfather killed a lot of deer with a 222 Remington. And a repo man said, I've used a 222 Remington for years on a farm in Missouri, and I don't remember shooting anything past 200 yards. Mostly they were 100 yards or so, but I never had one run far, certainly no farther than any other rifle I own. It's a nice shooting gun. It's accurate, lightweight, Shot placement and distance are the main things, just like any other firearm. Honestly, poachers have been killing deer with a plain old 22 long rifle forever. <laughs> They're cheap and disposable, not ethical or legal, but it happens more often than one might think. Depending on what part of the country you go to, I've heard it happen more than once on our farm, road hunters mainly. Yeah, that's a, a point that we bring up quite often too, you know, and Guys, we are not recommending that you go out and get the lightest weight bullet and the lightest weight cartridge you can possibly handle for taking deer. It's just that we've got to be realistic about this stuff. It happens because it can happen and it does happen. You do not need a monster cartridge in caliber with a sledgehammer effect to take deer. It's the, the bullet causing hemorrhaging and has been proven so many times in so many jurisdictions. Bullets from 22 caliber on up can do the job. We all get to make our own assessments and choose what works for us within the rules and regulations of the state in which you're hunting, of course. So 
Those were some of the hot questions that were popping up this week. And now we're going to see what the team has brought up for me. See if they've got anything to equal this. And we're going to start right off with a Canadian up in Quebec. Antoine, I think you pronounce that. Hi, Ron. I want to get into hunting. And as a broke student, I'm looking for a relatively cheap but accurate and reliable rifle. Now, you're not the only one in that boat. I think we all started out that way. What would you pick between a Mauser M18 or a Ruger American Go Wild, either in 6.5 Creedmoor or 308? I'm from Canada, so a threaded barrel is not a big deal since we can't own suppressors anyway. I'm leaning toward the Mauser in 308 because ammo is cheap and they have a sub MOA guarantee. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think that's not a bad choice. I have used uh, that Mauser and I found everything about it to be really solidly built, well built in an inexpensive kind of starter rifle. Um, and it was wonderfully accurate. Um, but there was a bit of a hitch in the bolt. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Nothing major, but there was a little something about uh, the bolt kind of sticking for just a second. I can't remember if it was on the extraction or coming forward to close it. But once I got used to that little hitch, I could run the bolt effectively past that. Something to do with, I don't think it was cocking. It's something to do with the ejection, I believe. But that was the only little hitch, and that was with the first generation that came out. They may have fixed that, or they may consider it to be uh, just a part of the program and the way it works, and it's not really a problem. The Ruger American Go Wild, I'm sure that the Go Wild is just sort of a variant on the basic um, action, and I've used the Ruger American in several different cartridges, and they've all been consistently accurate. Um, most recently, we tested one in a 308 uh, Winchester for our 308 Winchester week. And it was, boy, it was one of the better shooting rifles in the bunch, as I recall. You might want to check those videos out, 308 Winchester week on my regular channel, Ron Spomer Outdoors. Um, and that one's really an inexpensive option that a lot of folks like. So I don't know. You're going to have to play around with both of them, decide for yourself. What I often say to guys when they're asking about, should I buy this rifle or that, is you really need to find out if it feels right to you. So many of these rifles these days are made quite well, in the, and even these starting rifles. But some of them feel chintzy. Eh, some of them feel clunky. Some of them that just don't seem to fit well. Too heavy, too thick of a stock, or too slim and tiny of a stock, who knows what. But we all have our preferences. So I would say get a hold of them, uh, borrow one if you can to shoot it and get an idea. But I think they're both very well made rifles and they've stood the test of time now for several years, even though they're fairly new models. So I think you can do quite well with either one of them. And of course, if you see some kind of a guarantee like that, MOA guarantee, you might m help. To help you make up your mind. There is one interesting point that Backfire made about this uh, sub MOA guarantee, which is spot on. And that is, it's pretty good to get a tour to reach that guarantee if you try hard enough. And this is how it plays out. They guarantee that with good ammunition or, or match grade ammunition or some kind of a qualifier about the ammunition um, at that a good shooter with a good bench and blah, blah. They've got all these qualifiers. And it's understandable. You don't want to just promise somebody he's going to shoot an uh, MOA if he stands up and shoots offhand. So you've got to make these qualifications. But when you really start to look at them, it's possible for most folks with most rifles to eventually get three shots to land inside of a minute of angle. Uh, it might be a fluke, but it can happen, right? So you get one three-shot group and the next 10 three-shot groups you shoot are two MOA or one and a half MOA, not one MOA. But their guarantee means it only has to happen once. So you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. Can it be repeatable? I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's better than no guarantee at all. All right, now let's drop way south and warm up here in Florida with Aaron. Hey, Ron, I have a question about barrel burnout. Wait a minute, didn't we just cover that? <laughs> Oh, you weren't here yet. Okay. So I have a Savage, a 110 Tactical in 300 Winchester Magnum. I absolutely love to shoot this gun. And yes, even in full power loads with no break or device of any kind, woo, it's a heavy gun, so it takes the recoil. Anyway, 
I also hand load. So my question is, if I back off on my charge, and let's say I shoot 160 or 165 grain bullets at around 2,700 feet per second or 2,800 feet per second, will this help with barrel life? Love to know your thoughts. Thanks, Ron. Aaron, absolutely. But it's not the bullet weight. It's that velocity. Remember what I said earlier in the show, flame temperature. The more powder you shoot down that bore, the more burnout you're going to get. So you can shoot 150 grain bullets, 180, 250, doesn't really matter on the weight. It's the flame temperature. So if you cut back on your muzzle velocity, obviously you're burning less powder. So you're going to have less fire burning out that throat. Good option. All right. New Mexico going out west here. Turner. Howdy. I'm a 22 long rifle shooter and a huge fan of your videos. Thank you, Turner. I appreciate that. I've learned a lot from your videos. My question is, could you make some ballistic videos on the 22 caliber rifles? Thanks, Turner. Well, sure, Turner. Um, I've done some already. I've got uh, at least three or four on the 22 center fires. Uh, we've discussed which ones work better for options on deer hunting or predator hunting, coyote hunting. We've also done things on the 22 rim fire. I'm not sure if you mentioned you mentioned the 22 long rifle, which is the rim fire. So are you meaning rim fires on all of these or all 22 caliber rifles, center fires included? We have done some things on the 22 long rifles too. So go to Ron Spomer Outdoors regular YouTube channel and look for 22 rim fire, 22 long rifle. See what you can find there because I know we have done several on that. In fact, I remember years and years ago when I was just getting started, and we probably going back to 2013 or 2014. I did a video in which I shot a 22 long rifle and a 22 Winchester Magnum, and I think a 17 HMR, and maybe even a 17 Winchester um, uh, short Magnum, all rim fires, and I tested them against one another for velocity and all the usual, but also shot jugs of water with them to show the impacts, which were really quite surprisingly different. You might want to search for that one too. But yeah, there's some out there, and I will be doing more. In fact, I've already started writing um, to get a little idea of how I want to approach another one. We've got some new 22 cartridges coming down the pike, I think, going to be released this year. So I want to cover those and compare them to the older ones to help us all understand what we might be gaining from the new ones versus the old standards. And there might be more or less in it than you might think. So stay tuned for that one. But I'll dive into some more of the 22 rimfires too, because I really like those. They're a lot of fun and one can, can do a lot more with one than uh, most folks think. A lot of guys out there shooting 300 and even 400 yards now with 22 long rifles, and that can be a lot of fun. All right, out in California, Mark is asking us something. Let's find out what. Hi, Ron. I hope this finds you well. Well, I think I'm in pretty good shape here yet. Thank you, Mark. A good friend of mine got drawn for his first elk hunt in Colorado, December 2024. He's gotten drawn already? I didn't know that was out. At any rate... His only rifle is a Remington 707 millimeter SAUM, SOM, Short Action Ultra Magnum. Plenty of gun. My question is, well, we need info. We're working on a hand load with the newish Barnes LRX 145 grain bullets. They look good on paper. The BCs are better than the 150 grain he's loading currently. Better downrange energy as well. He was able to sell his left foot and he found a box. <laughs> so he traded his left foot for a box of that ammo. The foot will grow back. We were correct. That round likes his gun, and it shoots very well. Nice groups. Better than his 150s. All right. Our problem is we can't find a recipe on the Barnes site, the website, to support the 145 LRX. We also scoured the web and many blogs. Nothing. The box we found was an off-brand, but it shot great. It was loaded to 3,050 feet per second with 145 grain LRX. Can you lead us to a place where we can find a recipe or maybe off the top of your head or under your hat. <laughs> His current load with 150s is as follows. And I don't want to go into all that uh, in case somebody gets the wrong numbers in their heads and they do something wrong here. But um, he asks if it's safe to use the 150 grain load they developed with the 145. Not necessarily, but you're close. 
Then, bam, 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 bam. So what do we do? We have a chronograph so we can watch for pressure problems along the way. How do we do it? Yeah, thanks in advance, Mark. Mark, sounds like you're on top of this pretty darn well, but what you want to do is get data for a lighter weight bullet um, and work your way up. I know the spear hand loading manual, I forget the number, but the most recent one, they have a 145 grain bullet in there. And you can pretty much swap out data for any 145 grain bullet with the LRX of 145 grain. The um, X bullets don't have any more friction and raise pressures really any than standard bullets these days. So you're okay making that change. Then just get the data out of that spear manual, start at their starting load, as you say, watch your pressure signs and your velocities and work your way up. I think you'll be fine. If you want to start with your 150 grain data, five more grains in a bullet stepping up, that's not a lot of percentage. I think if you go with your starting load on your 150s and then use your 145, shouldn't be any kind of a problem there as well. And then you can work your way up. You might find that you'll use a slightly faster burning powder more effectively with your 145s than your 150s. But again, it's not a huge difference in bullet weight, so you should be fine. Sounds like you know what you're doing, so more power to you. All right, out in Washington, uh, Washington State, I assume, Jaden asks about uh, 243 Winchester. We get a lot about the 243 Winchester. Hi, Ron. I'm a big fan of you, both your channels. I appreciate your knowledge and your expertise in firearms and cartridges. I've been looking into information on the 243 Winchester for elk hunting. It seems very controversial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is your experience with the 243 in big game? Would it be viable option for African game? And if so, what would be its limitations? Yeah, I have. I have not used it on elk, but a lot of Western hunters have and continue to and report really good results. And I always go back to a, a guy I knew, gosh, 30 years ago, who had taken, if I remember right, 13 six-point bull elk with 13 shots from his 243 Winchester. How's that for performance? But of course, he was very cautious. I think he said he got within 100, 150 yards of each one, very calmly took a behind-the-shoulder broadside shot. And you know what's going to happen then. That bullet's going to slip through the ribs or hit a rib and easily get through. There's not much there. Get into the lungs and heart area, do the hemorrhaging damage, and there's your animal. Works. But man, if you are tempted to take a shot when that elk is quartered away or on the front shoulder or anything like that, you may have issues. So you have to be very cautious if you think about using a 243. Now, a lot of folks will say, I'm crazy. I shouldn't even suggest it. I can't help it, guys. These are the reports coming out of the field. People report that it works. Can't deny it. And I would rather have someone who's, say, recoil sensitive, flinching with a big magnum and, and making gut shots or missing all together or breaking a leg or something. I would rather have somebody shooting a lighter recoiling rifle precisely and putting that bullet in the right place than the opposite. So I can stand behind the 243 Winchester with the right shooter and the right positioning of the elk and et cetera, et cetera. And also pay attention to your bullets. You're going to want to use a controlled expansion bullet. I always recommend the coppers because they're so darn reliable, retain their weight, penetrate so well. Um, and pretty much any of the newest coppers are going to do the job for you. I haven't used them all, but boy, the ones I've used, I'm really impressed with. Otherwise, go with a controlled expansion like an all-bonded bullet. This um, would be any of the ones that are called inner bond or acubond or some kind of a bond in the name. The Federal Terminal Ascent is a real good option. And the Swift Sirocco is a bonded bullet. The Swift A-frame is a good hard bullet. That will stay in one piece and penetrate very, very well. So, yeah, that's what you want to look for. Good controlled expansion bullets in it. Ideally, I'd want you to step up to at least a 6.5 or a 27. 270, 6.8 Western, 270 Weatherby Magnum, WSM, something like that. But, you know, if you're good with a 243, you feel comfortable with it, it's going to do the job for you. If you do your job. <laughs> All right, down in Texas, Joshua. Will increasing a rifle's twist rate decrease its muzzle velocity? Boy, I don't think so, Josh. Let me think about that for a second. You know, you've still got your same powder volume and gas pressures behind that bullet. 
it's pushing it down the barrel. There's a little bit more friction because you've got a little bit steeper wall in those grooves, the land to groove edge where that bullet is being carved or scribed as it goes down the bore. A little more friction here just because it's a little bit steeper wall. But you still got that gas pressure driving that bullet. So I don't think it's going to change the velocity. If it does, it's not going to amount to a hill of beans. It could raise your pressures slightly with the same load because of that increased friction of the wall on that um, rifling edge. But I don't think it's any kind of a problem. I have not noticed it at any of the rifles I've shot, whether they're really super fast twist barrels or not. So I think you can rest easy on that one. Central New York State, Anthony. I've seen your podcast on the 30 6 cartridge and its flexibility. One cartridge combination I didn't see you speak about, the Remington Accelerator with a 55 grain 22 caliber bullet in the 30 6 I'd like to know if you've ever used one, what the ballistics would be like, and how much twist we would need to stabilize that bullet. Okay, good questions, Anthony. I have not hunted with one. I've shot a few. Um, and I have some friends who had them, and they were never satisfied with the accuracy. This is the common complaint with those accelerator loads that Remington used to make. And I don't know if they still make them. I don't think so. But um, I'm pretty sure hand loaders can get the parts they need to make this kind of bullet. And what it amounts to is a sabo. So you've got a plastic skirt around a smaller caliber bullet. And the plastic skirt, of course, is 308 diameter. And that's what's going to grab, be grabbed by the rifling to spin the bullet and stabilize it on all the rest. Um, it's just that you don't get quite the precision you would from a full caliber bullet when you do that. And that's probably why they're not all that accurate. I think the spin rate is good enough to stabilize that bullet. Um, the ballistics, of course, are wonderful because you're pushing an extremely lightweight bullet with all of the powder you have in that big case. So. The skirt falls away from the bullet once it emerges from the muzzle. And then the bullet, only weighing 55 grains, is going to be going 4,000 some feet per second. That is an absolute screamer. So you've got some cool benefits that way if you could just get them to be accurate. Now, if there are some folks out there who have been playing around with these Sabo skirts on a load like that and have figured out how to make them accurate, boy, write in and let us know. I would like to share that information because it's a great idea and it's used successfully in shotguns, for instance. There are a lot of slug guns now that shoot the Sabo bullets um, and they run those through a rifled barrel and get incredibly good accuracy for a slug gun. So why couldn't we do that with some center fires? And we probably can. We just have to figure out how and I'll bet you somebody out there knows. So send that in and we will talk about it next time we get some good information. That looks like finally the end of all the questions. Boy, that was a nice stack this week. I want to thank you all for writing in. Uh, thanks especially to our patrons. We appreciate not only your questions, but your support. And anybody wants to join us on Patreon, of course, you can just go to patreon.com and then punch in Ron Spomer Outdoors. All of our information should pop up. You can also go to Ron Spomer Outdoors website, ronspomeroutdoors.com, and not only find out how to join us on Patreon there, but you could join RSO TV to get all of these videos and podcasts without any commercial interruptions. And you can buy some of our books, like the new 7mm book that's on the site. And we still have a few copies. We got a little search in the attic that turned up another box of the old predator hunting book. So that's all about rifles and cartridges for hunting coyotes and foxes and bobcats and even bears and cougars and uh so we'll send in on that and we'll get those in the mail to you guys and appreciate all the support until next time an honest to shoot straight